Hey, welcome to this episode of Hollywood Breaks. I personally love Keith's newsletter, The Founders Brew, and this week in his newsletter, he covered this idea of leadership in Hollywood, what Zaslav is doing differently to think about theatrical first, and really some interesting moves that other platforms and people need to make to keep the industry moving forward. So we talked about this and many other things on this episode of Hollywood Breaks. Enjoy. Keith, guess what I'm drinking right here? Vision Craft Brew. Some Vision Craft Brew. <laughs> uh, I got to get Love you one of the mugs. <clears throat> I got to order you. I'm gonna. I think that's what I'm gonna get everyone for Christmas. I'm gonna get them the Vision Craft Brew beer mugs that my wife yes. got me for yes. Christmas. It should yes. be like, like a beer stein. I it, guess. it is. It's a beer. It's a beer mug. It's not a stein. It's like just like a beer glass. All right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the actual brew you're gonna put inside of it someday. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> right now the brew I get is it coming out of your head. That's <laughs> that's, exa- the... that's the point. <laughs> it's the brew out of my head. I don't have brew I, beer. Come on. I love the title this week. Holy bold move, Batman. That is like a great title right there. Well, you guys, we we stole my other title that I had, Bat Bat Bleep Crazy, which we used for the podcast last oh. week. So I had to come up with something else. I would have switched it with you. This is a good one too. No, I, I actually, I, when I came up, I was like, okay, they like this. This works. This works too. So yeah, it, it's yeah. interesting. The conversation, you know, it's a continuation from last week a little bit, mm-hmm. but I, um, it's interesting the way we're talking about, you were talking about it in the idea of leadership, because you, you know, I want to say just from the very, one of the first conversations we had on the show here was recognizing we're still looking at old Hollywood leadership. The the mm-hmm. studios don't have new fresh blood in there in great, great ways. <clears throat> They're not asking new questions. The pandemic did something in that process as well, but you're kind of making the point of, well, at least he's doing something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I give Zaslov credit, you know, he spent a lot, he did a lot of the work that I think maybe Jason Kalar didn't do, which is sort of like meeting people in town. You know, he had Brian Lord sort of escorting him around to all these meetings, they're having dinner parties, this is the new guy, he's coming in. And I think the fact that he's come in with like a hatchet, to the point where they're calling him Zaz the Butcher. <laughs> um it's a little bit of a shock to everybody because they were like oh this guy was you know whining and dining and saying he believes in in the movie business which he does i mean he is committed to theatrical they announced today or i believe it was today or yesterday that they're they're only going to apply the 45 day window to certain movies i mean that's like a hallelujah to the to the exhibitors who are like desperate for material um and he's 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 turning up the number of movies that Warner Brothers is going to release. Um, and you know what? I, I applaud him for saying, like, listen, this movie doesn't meet with our quality standards. It doesn't meet with the strategy for where we want to take DC. Why are we going to throw this out there and try to save it? They already spent, it was already $20 million over budget, according to reports, due to COVID restrictions. And why, and apparently it tested in the, in the toilet. So they're like, why are we going to spend all this money to try to save this movie? when we can just shelve it, take a tax write off and start all over again. And the town's like, oh my God, this is so horrible for the creatives. I'm like, well, in a way, yeah, it's an uncomfortable conversation. But as I pointed out, that's why you're paid the big bucks to have those uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> it's just, uh, when the I mean, I guess we, we'd all imagine that conversation and not wanting to be in the room, right? It's just right. not the one you want to be. Or be in the room and not have to say anything. <laughs> And just yeah. enjoy the show. Just be watching what's wow, this is the most incredible. Wow, it's a tennis. <laughs> Goes as what the guy? <laughs> yeah. But you know, it is that's the bold part of it. You have to yes. have banked a lot of goodwill or have mm-hmm. a clear understanding where you're going. It it kind of expresses strong vision of who you are yeah. and what you're about that you can right. say, wow, this is a very difficult decision, but it's the right one because I know what I want to do with the studio and how I want it to work. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, then, there's a little bit of excitement around. Yeah, that absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, I listen, I, I think there's all, there's a lot of fear because there, he's going to make a, a ton of cuts probably because he has to, to meet the $3 billion in savings that he's promised to the wall, to the investors. So there's going to be a lot of cuts, which it's, it's terrible for Warner brothers because they've been, they just went through a series of cuts two years ago. And I make this point in the newsletter, a lot of this is not necessarily the result of anything, any one person making decisions. It's just they've they've just been through a lot of turmoil over the last decade or so. Pretty much since like Alan Horn and Barry Diller left the studio, there's just been turmoil 
even when Time Warner still owned Warner Brothers um, and Bukes kind of put in the whole like bake off for who was going to replace Alan, Alan Horn and Barry Diller. Um, it's, you know, and then that led to another bake off and who was going to run the studio. I mean, it was just, it, le it was all over the place. And then AT&T comes in and then that's put in limbo for two years as they fight the justice department and finally win. And by that time it's kind of already damaged. They come in clearly don't know what the heck they were doing. And, uh, you know, didn't realize the amount of money it was going to take. So they're like, we need to get out of this game. So then Dazlov comes in and is like, yeah, I can, I can do this. Look what I did to discovery. I can, I can make this work and he and he's putting that plan into place and he's recommitting to theatrical all great things he's being he's made it very clear that they're not going to spend like drunken sailors to in streaming because it's just not um where that where their direction's heading and they're going to recommit to quality on the dc side and you know I, we'll see if it <laughs> sticks because here's the other thing in two years they could be so be being bought by comcast and then we could be right back and this could be oh yeah right could start up <clears throat> no start i feel like they, warner brothers has that it room where it just has the cables everywhere because a hundred people have touched it and no one's really <laughs> had a clear exactly. mapping of it all over the place it's it's just, like, what, wait what yeah. is this going now <laughs> right so then to do Who's something you're to? unplugging it and you shut down half a floor because you didn't realize that's the way it's kind of been just it right it just accumulates over time to have someone say hey let's let's understand what what we're mapping here mm -hmm. and then let's make the right connections to get us the right direction right. um and that there's something it is exciting about there is something exciting about that kind of leadership that somebody has a clarity and vision especially Warner brothers you know, I, their early moves and kind of their pandemic planning or whatever was a little um, off, off putting their HBO Max kind of launch to things. And, you know, they I feel like they weren't really caring for who the creatives were in the field. Right. They were simply running to cut back money, which might just be an AT&T agenda over everything else. But this is saying something different of like. Oh, let's invest in Hollywood. Let's let's invest right. in quality. Let's invest in a brand. Let's invest in something that separates us from the pack. And yeah, we have to kind of unplug things for a while and shut down a floor until we can rewire it. But then when we get there, exactly. it'll be a much, much cleaner map, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big thing is it's it's also a very much a rip, um, sort of repudiating anything that Jason Kalar put in place. <laughs> it's essentially Zaslav saying this guy went way far afield of which way direction I would go, and he pretty much did that from start. You know, CNN Plus was a big thing. Kalar was a big believer in. He kills that like the first week he takes over, and then you know the HBO Max was like Kalar wanted to put movies on HBO Max. Zaslav was like, nope, we're not doing that. Oop, pulls that plug recommits to theatrical recommits to you know not necessarily to a longer window beyond the 45 day which you know warner brothers had just committed to that not more than i think six seven months ago and now they're reversing stream so he's doing he's, he's doing a lot of things that i think the town should be excited about yeah he's recommitting to theatrical now are there going to be some painful cuts and some you know not being allowed to spend as much money as he used to be able to yeah probably no, already. But, I mean, cutting already back, doing that. back early is that, yeah. But, um, you know, I think it, in the end, it, it, I think it's going to lead to a, a better quality product you know, when, when it's all said and done. So I, I think this is, like I said, it was a bold move. He got a lot of flack for it. You, I credit to Pam and Michael DeLuca, Pam Abdi and Michael DeLuca for coming in there and saying, you know, we got to make this tough decision. Um, I, you know, the, the only, the person I really feel for it in this whole moment is Walter Hamada, who's the head of DC, who has just been sort of pulled in 50 different directions. He's been told 10 different things. He's definitely righted the ship somewhat with in terms of the quality of DC films, especially after the disaster that was the Zack Snyder verse of everything in terms of right. people more or less rejecting that vision. And I think he has done a, a, a admirable job of sort of being following whichever which way he's commanded and now you know i from what i've heard he was miffed about the bad girl because he felt like it was decision made without his input i don't know if that's true or not um and, i mean they can't know, be that, hurt too bad they were the number one action moment in superheroes for the oscars with the flash no, moment right versus, right yeah right well uh, I mean, here's they the can't thing. be you know, <laughs> uh, you know he he was he was there i believe he well no i don't think he was there for wonder Woman. But he was there for Batman. He was there for Aquaman. Um, and Batman was, you know, 
was a success. And they released that simultaneously on streaming and it was a success at the box office and on streaming. So, I, you know, you got to give credit to the guy. And I feel yeah. like he's being like pushed out because he's just getting lost in the shovel. I mean, you know what? Sometimes that happens to use the cliche. It's show business, not show friendship. So unfortunately he got caught up and all that, but I think he's a very competent executive. I'm sure he'll end up on his feet. Somewhere well, I, I love the pivot thinking about, you know, studios being in the movie business and having a voice there. <laughs> right. I don't know. Um, you know, we were talking about prey, um, mm -hmm. and just the, the accolades it's getting, and it kind of made me think of how interesting it is to, um, be a movie maker going towards a theatrical release has a different mm -hmm. appeal to it than somebody that's making a longer form piece of content that's digital and deliver the same way as TV shows. Right. So that right. ongoing kind of joke conversation we have there. Um, but you know, and the thought maybe of what it that people are saying, oh my gosh, Prey missed a step. They should have gone to theatrical. Where two years ago people were praising it like, oh, aren't you so wonderful? You don't need theatrical. Everything could just be right there on the on the you know, yeah, on the television set. Um, so you know, it's interesting where um, we, there's a little bit of a recoil. We'll see how long it lasts. That says, well, we're not going to chase Disney to the top. We're not going to chase Netflix to the top. All that kind of stuff. We're going to be in the movie business. Let's make movies. Um, right. And you know, Prey is something that it'd be interesting for her to have them go from OTT into the theaters later. It might be like right. they could possibly get so much reputation that they could draw a theatrical audience. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of what this is driven by, I think this is very much a, this seems like a very Kareem Daniel division, strategic data driven decision because the last, the, the brand of Predator. To, to put it on OTT, to release correct. on a Hulu. To release on a Hulu because, you know, 20th century <clears throat> studios, I have to <laughs> skip over the Fox there. Uh, 20th century studios, as it's now known, is basically going to be a pipeline for Hulu in terms of movies. I think that's been their edict. That's what's come down from on high. Um, but as far as this being a, um, a genre, sort of a... Uh, genre play in terms of the Predator franchise, which has been damaged over the last few years by some <clears throat> lower quality movies. I worked on one of them when I was at Fox. It was the one with Robert, that Robert Rodriguez directed, I think it was called Predator Dur, singular. <laughs> Predator and, uh, Dur. <laughs> Predator, and it had Adrian Brody in it. And um, that didn't, wasn't necessarily well received by the, you know, movie going community so I, I under and then there was another one called predators i think that which was sing, well, plural which also was not well received so the 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 shot the the franchise was damaged mm -hmm. um so from a sort of like let's look at the tar let's look at our what we have data wise i'm sure they looked at you know most likely to see a movie in theaters and it probably wasn't high um so i think this was you know an easy decision as far as they're concerned. But at the same time, you look at Batman, which had a success, also very somewhat uneven, uh, you could argue, franchise yeah, history. True. <clears throat> but, and you know, it, it seems to have done really well for Hulu. It's, they announced- Is this the, is this when you miss your uh, days at Fox? Cause you know, no. old faction, structural <laughs> faction pipeline, Prey would have come across your desk. You would have had a deal. I probably would have worked on and it. Then um, it, and it would have been some, you know, unexpected hit. And you guys would have got all the credit. Marketing would have got all the credit for doing yeah, something well, amazing. Well, you know, marketing isn't marketing is going to get none of the credit for this. Like it's it's. I mean, that's that. I mean, we we've had people on this show who have who have worked on both sides of the aisle, and they said that's the biggest hard the hardest part of working in streaming is it's just like there's no celebration. It's like it goes out on to the next. Whereas at least in theatrical, you get that Monday or Tuesday where you're all just like, yeah, we did it. We opened this sucker. And then when in week two, it doesn't drop 60%. Then you're like, yeah, the movie's actually working. It's good. Like, this is awesome. We actually made something that people are enjoying. And I was a part of that. But with streaming, it's like, okay, it's out. Yeah, they love the movie, but they don't say, wow, the trailer was great. Or the campaign was great. Because it's, not, well, it's even, not what drives it any. It's even not, if they knew it was today, like even if they were celebrating because they get some accolades, they've moved on to the next thing. Yeah, it's, they're so far to like. One. 
Yeah, yes. you might say something in the hallway, but you're not actually yeah, the red gonna, car is not like pulling up to the parking spot. Between Steve Asbell and whoever worked, I think actually my former boss, Elio Rice, worked on this uh on the cut of this, but I'm not entirely sure. But I'm sure it was just he and Steve just walking in the hallway. Yeah, good work, man. <laughs> because it's like, you know, it it's not, it's just it's not it doesn't have the same experience. It just doesn't. Yeah. And I think that, you know, honestly, the pressure is probably a little less simply because, you know it there's not as much involved it's usually just a trailer and a couple and maybe a, a poster and maybe a couple tv spots that go digital spots that's it you're not you're not pulling together a top gun-esque type campaign or doing a, a dungeons yeah. and dragons reveal at comic-con you're not doing those kind of big things you're you're doing very small ball stuff and when you're in the creative ad game it's 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 about going to the trail it's about going to the theater on a weekend for a trailer test and watching your the your your piece in front of an audience for really the first time and seeing if there's any reaction and seeing seeing it on a big screen. I mean, you see it on the big screen when you go to a, a sound check, but it's a little different when you're sitting there in the theater with with other people you don't it's even know. So different. And I, you're I, watching it. I, I mean, I'm clearly probably the most excited about getting er there to the theater early so i can watch the trailers just being in That'd the trailer business right it's yeah. just you you can see it you want to you want to be part of it there's some fun stuff going on um uh, and it's there is it there sometimes the the trailer has a different setup for the, your entire theatrical experience because mm -hmm. some trailer just going from trailer to trailer every two minutes you get you can switch genres in between it's a very fun kind of ex little film experience to be doing that yeah yeah <clears throat> but in this case i feel like you know, the missed opportunity of what this trailer would be to the rollout of the film, especially with the kind of uh, impressions it's getting. Um, there's something, I don't know, like it's something missed, I guess. That's yes. it's, it's like, there's just something missed. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it's a difference between watching your trailer for the first time on YouTube, which is okay. And then seeing it in a theater for the first time with a full audience and yeah. gauging reaction or, you know, especially in LA because people react in trailers in LA. Yeah. And there's so a buildup of like get, hearing about it, seeing a trailer about it. And then right. the, the film comes out and then the rollout out post a theatrical release, all of that had an arc to it as well that yeah. you can enjoy the, you know, the entire approach and then mm -hmm. the actual watching of it and then the, the, the release afterwards. And now it really is, you know, I press the button. Oh, I like that. Okay, press another button. Okay. Yeah, you like, like it and then you immediately forget about it. You know, it, I saw the trailer. I was like, oh, this looks pretty. I mean, I was really intrigued by the, the angle they took with it. I had no idea it was a Predator movie until I yeah. actually watched it. I mean, the only hint was the the alien blood on, you know, the, the lady's face and you were like, oh, okay maybe this is a, is a predator and then you watch it and you're like oh it is and it's in the seventh it's in the 18th century i'm like okay i like where this is going so but yeah. i and right after that i forgot about it and you know it's not like you know i ran back to watch it again i don't know it just they there's just something that's just missing when it's a streaming versus a theatrical release and i yeah <clears throat> you know like the disney machine seems to to be eating up what their you know their digital play is too i mean if really to not recognize the opportunity here soon enough that they went, you know, straight to Hulu. Um, you know, the the Disney Plus, you know, Disney Plus is still missing missing a lot of pieces <clears throat> or content that I want to see, unless it right. really is Star Wars, Marvel, or kids shows, which I don't have little <laughs> kids, so we don't watch, you know, Frozen on Loop or whatever. A oh, lot of people you do are. With Disney Plus. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or whatever the latest one is. Uh, it's in Canto would be the latest one, Tim. Is that the latest one? That's yeah. the latest one. Yes. I try to, to watch about Red. Bruno anymore. I'm going to um, blow my head off. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I try to watch Red on the plane. Uh, anyway, I was like, is this like, you know, like that was like, wow, D Pixar's lost a little bit of magic. But uh, that's a tangent. That's a um, whole nother episode in of itself. A totally different tangent. <laughs> but the, like the Disney play and where Disney's kind of just pushing content to see how it lists uh it lasts on their platform mm -hmm. um really shows their hands a lot where you know they they're they're a film they're a studio like warner brothers and they're you know kareem daniel is doing something very different when he's thinking about what his job is opposed to yeah. zasloff 
Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, they, they, they had an earnings report this week and, you know, the headline out of it for a lot of people was that Disney beats Netflix with the most uh, users. And our friend, Sean McNulty over at the Ankler had a, a great piece in his, um, his wake up on, uh, I think it was uh, Wednesday or Thursday, where he sort of dived into the numbers um, and why that headline is a little misleading. Um, particularly if you look at sort of what the, they call the average uh, revenue per user, um, where Disney is still like kind of in the $4 range, $4.35 per user, whereas Netflix estimated, and this is global, by the way, $12 per user. Per user. <clears throat> so Netflix is still... Wait, to be clear, are they saying user like when I turn on the platform and there's five people in my family, there's five users? No, or it's they mean total, subscribers. Uh, I think it, like it's households. basically subscribers per user slash okay, yeah. subscriber. Because I was thinking, uh, of course, Disney has more users. There's more yeah. people that their little kids have their own face on the Disney platform opposed to the yeah. Netflix one. And he makes um, a really good so point. So they're not hitting their, they're not even hitting the same revenue per no, uh, they're subscriber. Not. They're, spot, not. Right? They're, not, they're not hitting the same revenue that Netflix is. I mean, they may have wow. more numbers, and the other thing that was kind of buried is that they had basically a nil growth quarter domestically. They added maybe a hundred thousand users, um, which is basically <laughs> nil. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a bit of a alarm bell for them, I think. Um, I mean, they did really well overseas. They had a bit of a, a blip in India because of, they lost the streaming rights to cricket, which is was their big boom in um, in India because it's such a huge sport over there. They lost, they lost those right. I think it's the Paramount International. They still have the broadcast rights, but they don't have the streaming rights. Wow. So they lost some, some numbers there. Um, and then they also had to sort of down, you know, reverse downward, rev rise downward some of their total targets for the next two years in terms of total users. Um, so I don't think it was all roses. I mean, I think they're, they have to, they're going to have to, they're doing a price raise, which always causes a little bit of a consternation, mm. particularly if, in that we're sort of in a recession, depending on who you talk to and what side of the political eye you're on. Um, so, you know, that I think is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. They're going to roll out an ad supported version, which I think one of the reasons that Netflix is rushing to get theirs out, um, because that's also going to lead to some competition. Um, but I think Disney really, you know, I think, Again, to Sean's credit, he just laid out the details like this is all clickbait. Like this isn't true. Like if you dive into the numbers, Netflix is still the king. Now is Disney gaining? Yeah, in some ways they are, um, but they don't. I I mean the other the other challenge for Disney is they don't necessarily have the product that dominates culturally sometimes as much as a Netflix. You know, especially their TV shows. I mean, how they just dominate the conversation for weeks on end and Netflix, Disney sort of been like Star Wars and Marvel. But other than that, they haven't really popped anywhere. And I think that's got to be. Yeah, a I think I'm concern. waiting for the next drop. I, I you know, I, it's again, as a platform that I think they bank a lot on their library, which they have a great yeah. library. They are Disney. Yeah. And yep. for your household, it's amazing because yep. you have everything you need and you don't need the. 14 bookshelves we needed when my kids were around to hold every VHS copy of something of, that they mm -hmm. released. Um, so I, I got to get that part. It's, it's brilliant, but I, I almost wonder if we should recognize that they're, they're just not, it might not be Disney in Disney's best interest to be the number one subscribe platform. I mean, I get financially it's true, but right. who they are as a content making company, to recognize, well, no, they should actually just be Disney making Disney content. And we viewers will always want it. It's Disney. Um, and we'll right. come to it and we'll find it. But do you, if you have to dumb yourself down or create another universe of something to get more subscribers to, to, to chase Netflix, like, I don't know if you're chasing the right thing. You're like, right. sure that they're in front of you, but I'm not really sure it's the same race. Um, especially yeah, I mean, when it, Netflix and Disney make their content the, differently. Yeah, and there's one more one more data point I want to bring up that Sean highlighted was like Disney streaming in the second quarter had a loss of 1.1 billion. That was their quarter second quarter streaming loss. Netflix had a profit of 1.4 billion. 
So yeah, that's a lot not of exactly on different. Equal, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not exactly on equal footing. So yeah, yeah, they may have the same number of subscribers, but Netflix is just Netflix. Hulu, uh, Disney's got Disney Plus. They've got Hulu. They got ESPN. They got three separate pools they're pulling from, and Netflix is pulling from one. So I, it's again, it's right. clickbaity. But to your point, I think I think that's. And again, going back to Zaslav, I think that's really what he's realizing. It's like, well, I'm not going to win this race. I, I mean, and yeah, I have I have a great brand in HBO. I have a great brand in Discovery. Why am I going to just throw money after to try to enter enter into the entertainment semifinals, as Richard Rushfield calls it, between Disney and Netflix? I'm not I'm not going to be that game. That's not going to be me. I'm going to have HBO Max, which is a great quality product, has done relatively well. They've had some really good shows and. Um, you know, to to Kalar's credit, it was sloppy as hell, but Project Park Popcorn definitely helped HBO Max get on the map. It did, really, yeah. So, That's true. You know, I don't think there's any way. That Wonder Woman was a not the best way to do it. No, but. that was a terrible <laughs> movie. But we and then another podcast we had just about that. Um, but I think you're right. I think I, I mean I, I think Disney feels I think they're being pushed a lot by investors as well. That they have to they have to enter into the semifinals as Rushfield we call it because their stock bounced like seven I think seven percent after hours trading on on the numbers that they released so obviously there's a, a sense like okay it's going to be Disney and Netflix whereas Zaslav has the advantage of like you know what I'm not playing that game yeah I'm not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna rush after these two guys and they're gonna be spending like drunken sailors I have to be a little bit more physically responsible. And at the same time, I have a, a you know a, a cherished brand that I can take. A, two cherished brands, really. Well, three if you count Warner Brothers. Yeah, it's just um, not worth dumbing down your whole quality standard, no. dumbing down your brand to yeah. try to get I don't know fifteen percent more subscribers. Well, I think, I think again, I think that's the other struggle. I mean, we talked about the Marvel and the fact that the cracks are starting to show in their sort of in their quality control, and I think a lot of that is because prior to streaming, they were releasing movies, what, like once every 18, 20 months or so? That's a lot of time to sort of make sure you're, you know, getting things right, the director's right, you're in the editor bay, making sure the movie feels good, visual effects are looking good, all that stuff. From that to churning out, an ep, you know, movies and TV shows on Netflix, I mean, sorry, on Disney Plus. I mean, yeah, then the quality is going to start because there's only so many... Kevin Feige's who are going to be able to keep an eyeball on everything and make sure everything's up to mm -hmm. snuff. And I think that's the there other was thing, something again, fun talk. about the when it first came out, like the WandaVision moment or whatever. There was something kind of fun about that moment, like, oh, I see, oh, they're going to make this bridge. Yeah, but yeah. I guess obviously, as it's played itself out, you're like, oh yeah, of course you can't. It gets thinner, right? You take the yeah. same same pace and you just spread it out further. Like it just gets thinner as you do it. You're not yeah. going to be able to have yeah. like I, same, I same rich quality. There are definitely stories that lend themselves to 12, 13 episodes, right? Comic books are really hard to stretch that long um, because it's such a simple bad guy versus good guys type stories. You can throw in a little bit of gray here and there. I think what they did brilliantly with WandaVision is they sort of, flip the concept on its head like the first couple episodes you're like what is happening and then you finally realize oh this is all in Wanda's head and you're like wow okay this is interesting and it's sort mm -hmm. of like her and obviously the last couple episodes I think the whole show kind of fell apart a little bit because I felt like yeah. they they reversed into sort of comic book trope bad guy you know all of a sudden the military guy is the bad guy and yeah here we, and we're off to the races but I mean if you look at something like um uh falcon and uh, winter soldier that just dragged on i mean yeah. it just it like was three way episodes or whatever long. yeah that's yeah, like three episodes just kind of would like have you been take fine. one concept and you're like oh wait you've stretched it out you stretched yeah. out a 45 minute show into 45 uh or Ep four to five different episodes and it just, yeah i, never, it I didn't just, even finish that one yeah yeah I, I mean i it was way too long it got way boring i mean listen i love the banter between um you know winter soldier and and then and, and uh falcon but at the same time you know it's like that can only sustain so much yeah before yeah. you're like it's nice in a movie with little quips here and there but the entire show it's not going to sustain more than it is day. a very clear indicator of just some of the practical mm -hmm. reality of what it means to build an infinite platform and try to deliver something infinitely with finite resources right. finite yeah. people and finite time right you can't right. actually get there um no. so 
the the rollout plan or to hold things back or to actually just recognize that we humans want to consume things in different patterns as well. It's pretty smart. Yep. Well, I really appreciated Founders Brew this week. I like the. Oh, thank <clears> you. Yeah. I just I there's a there's I try to these make moments. Well, I just said I think there's moments where what we're trying to say here in this show is, hey, there's something different about Hollywood. And you probably want to understand some parts if you're navigating it and trying to make decisions. Um, but we should also understand, you know, what what is necessary to keep it going. And right. when we when we recognize the lack of leadership, or in this case, acknowledge when someone's making some strong leadership mm-hmm. decisions, maybe yeah. not the favorite decisions for everyone, but someone that's doing something, you say, oh, that's that's the real show business. Yeah, it's not just right. the movie. It's the somebody that's pushing a studio and agenda a content forward. That's kind of I mean, we're geeks, I guess. But that's what's exciting to us is to kind of understand the strategy that's that moving these big ships forward. Yeah. And then what it means to compete and possibly disrupt when that opportunity is there. So yeah, it was great. I love when yeah. the when the moment spins back to like, yeah, you're right, Keith, you're right. There is something to be said about that. Yeah, I'm going to record that. Lucky that we've just recorded. You're right. I'm going to hold on to that. <laughs> Holy bold move, Batman. That's Holy bold gonna, move. That's I'm right. Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for writing that, keeping that going. And thanks for joining me today. Um, of course. We're going to have some fun activity in the fall. We, I know Keith is working right now on uh, stirring up some fun connections for our future shows. Let's we'll so. see. Yeah. Well, let's hope yeah. so. A lot, of, good, a lot of cool a things coming in the fall. <laughs> Well, have a great time, uh, great weekend, continuing your vacation, and uh, we'll yeah, see you next I'm week. I'm on vacation. I'm just up north. I'm not on. Well, actually, I am on sure. vacation starting today. That is true. That is true. Is that right? Yes. So does that mean more lobster tails, something like that? Like, what does vacation no, mean? mean no, no, not more doing? lobster tails. More probably a little bit more sailing. Some more, you know, longer cocktail hours. <laughs> uh yeah a little bit more laid back than you know because i've i've had been working since i've been up here so it'll be nice to just kick back and relax for a little bit well get it all in before the kids go back to school i guess right this yes, is your exactly last that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah last year kids start in september so got to get it in now yep this is the moment all right well yep. enjoy yourself you have a great weekend Thank you. i'll see you next yeah, week you too